Okay, so I'm not going to be making the tile in this part of the video uh, with a big hole, a big chasm in it. I'm going to come to the one with the ruined walls. Um, in the description is a link to the video that I made um, on how I very quickly make my wall section, so I'm not going to bore you to tears with, with making those. Um, I do very quickly touch on ruining the walls. So how do I go about assembling this tile? Um, it's simple really. Where I have all my pre-made tiles and I have all my four and a half centimeter squares, I use these as uh, guides, basically. So what I want to do is I'm going to mark up my um, tiles for the ruined section and I'm simply going to line up roughly where I want this stuff to be according to the tile that I'm recreating. Uh, you don't need to use very many of your tiles as a guide for this. They're literally just sort of corner pieces for the sake of sort of dry fitting. And I do recommend dry fitting stuff as well. It will make a big difference to um, the overall construction um, because you don't want to be gluing something in and covering yourself in all kinds of garbage, um, basically. So take the time just to make sure everything fits, okay? So just literally using the tiles that I've already made just to give myself my guidance that I need, uh, to give myself my distance and my spacing, just like so. I'm going to line up what I can with my tile. Here we go. Okay, so I have my ruined section here. Now this one I actually did as a single piece, uh, just because I had a bit of an off cut um, available to do so. So I just did the the carve and put that in there. Let me just chuck that on. That one that I'd ruined. Test fit this quickly. Voila. Quite happy with that. And then my final pieces. Again, I literally used off cuts in some of these cases in order to make my um, my littlest wall sections here rather than ruining a column which is more difficult I had a small piece that was the right height and roughly the sort of size so knowing I was going to wreck it I wrecked it and here we have my dry fit um, ruined tile let me just belt my camera around here so I can turn it a bit more easily for you obviously this is still in its construction phase but you kind of get the general gist of what we're going for here with the tiles yeah and also the little bits you tear off when you're ruining the walls, don't chuck them away because they're going to become your rubble. All right, here we go. And obviously dry fitting reveals things like the amount of space that you've got in between these wall sections. Uh, it's a bit smaller, this ruined piece is, compared to the board, but I'm cool with that because I'm gonna build this up in a amount of rubble. And as long as I can get my miniatures on here and it feels appropriate, I'm not too worried about being absolutely surgically correct compared to the main tile. And there you go. So having test fit my pieces, I'm gonna get on with marking their positions and then gluing them in place and using my cocktail sticks to give myself some anchoring. Here we go. Okay guys, so before I get onto the adding of rubble and everything, the, uh, the walls are all attached to the base. I've used my cable ties, and I've used my tiles that I've made, and I have now glued them all on. The glue is still a bit wet, but that's okay. I just wanna show you. Um, I mean, this probably took me, in terms of assembling it, the best part of half hour just to stick all these tiles on and clip all the cable ties to fit. Just PVA glue to stick it all down. Can use super glue if you need something with a bit of a quick bond, but I recommend PVA alongside the super glue to get a good fix. Now, it's not the prettiest looking thing in the world at the moment, but that is okay. As I've said to you before, that's fine. Um, I personally quite like it, looking a bit rougher, a bit more random. Okay, so we have attached all the tiles. Um, it's literally just using cable ties trim to fit to go in between the gaps. Um, to reflect the sort of grills and the vents that you can see on the card tiles. They're literally just trimmed to fit. You can see that they're just stuck on there, PVA glue. I've left blank spaces where the holes in the wall are. 
because what I'm next going to do is put a little bit of the uh, foam that I've got left over just to build up the bulk of it a little bit and then all the bits that I've ripped out to make this funky looking shape I'm going to pin down with a bit of glue and make up my rubble piles then to reflect the collapse walls and what I'm going to do as well is I will have some of that rubble spilling out across some of these tiles here to that end I've tried to restrict the amount of tiles which I have got details on such as plastic hard or such as the sculptor's mesh um, I don't mind using it on a couple of them such as the one in the middle there that you can see um, because I don't mind hiding some of that detail as it helps the piece look alright um, but I'd rather hide ones that haven't used the, the mesh so I will now get on with a super speedy zippy video and I will start building up this little pile of rubble and what I'll do is I'll slow it down then uh, once I've done one pile just to show you a bit more slowly how I, I, I rubble it all up So there we go, one uh, speedy zippy little video later and you can see um, kind of my process a little bit there uh, that, I, that I'm going through with making the rubble. So the very quick version is built it up with a bit of um, foam just to put a bit of mass underneath it, used all my torn off bits after pouring on loads of PVA glue. And then I use my Wonder Decorative Sand from B&M, the really, really cheap stuff, um, after pouring on even more PVA. Um, and I'm just gonna let that set. Now, I'm not gonna pour this off, I'm just gonna let this glue dry. Um, oh, I'm just spotting a little bit of um, PVA glue there that's sort of sitting in the rungs. I'm just gonna fill it with a bit of this uh, rubbly material. Anyway, I'm gonna let that go. And uh, what I'll do now, I'll spin this around and I'll just repeat the process in a, in a slower video for you. Um, obviously, if you got what you needed from the uh, Speedy Uppy video, then by all means, skip this bit, but it won't take very long. So what I'm gonna do, let's just line this camera up here a little bit so you can see. So this is about mm, two inches by about two inches, this little space that I've got here. Um, and all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do exactly the same thing. I'm just gonna fill it and I'll block it up a little bit using nothing but waste polystyrene. In fact, what I'll do, I will just show you my big pile of waste stuff that I've kept on the side of the desk because I like to work in chaos. There's all my bits of junk that I've ripped off. I can just easily lay my hands on it. And that is there for me just to build up my little rubbly section. Okay, so look, don't be afraid to make a mess. That is half the fun. And what I'm gonna do, let me just get my light shifted around here so it's a bit better lit for you. There we go. Nice, decent dollop of uh, PVA glue in there. Uh, what I'll do is I will use one of my uh, older brushes just to spread that about a bit, just to make sure it sort of sits around underneath the edge of the walls. And I'm just gonna tear up a big chunk of um, spare foam and just stick that down. Don't be afraid of getting a bit of PVA on the tiles because we're gonna cover those up with um, some of our rubble material. So that's not really a problem. So I'm just gonna literally pop off a small piece um, this here is probably a little bit too big, so I'm just going to break it down. I just want to add height to the um, to the section that I'm working on. So I'm going to try and make like, almost like a miniature hill out of it, really, and then I'll I'll backfill the gaps then with um, with me bits of rubble. So it doesn't have to be perfect in shape, just enough to to get in there, stick that down. There we are. It's rough. It's ready. It'll do what it says in the tin. Fantastic. Right, so next bit, uh, again, just pile on loads of PVA glue and get yourself a bunch of uh, rubble and stick it all over the place to make it build up and look like the wall has collapsed. Don't forget this wall will collapse outwards, so give yourself a little half of a circle shape, a semicircular shape out. Fill it up with PVA, fill the gaps. We're going to cover all this and we want this PVA to grab the, the foam nicely. So don't be afraid of getting it on your styrene. So literally just picking out odds and sods. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna work backwards from the edge on this because I don't want the PVA to spread too far. And I'm just gonna try and find from my little pile of ruins um, the bits of foam that I want that look like collapsed, you know, whatever this is, concrete I suppose. And just press it down with your thumb or your finger into the PVA glue just to build up your mass of rubble. Now, 
this is a great way to um, practice carving with your walls. It's a great way to not waste any of this material. I mean, Celotex is probably the more expensive of the foam, but as I said, I prefer to use it because it's really nice to work with. It's not, um, <laughs> the only problem I really have with Celotex is the horrendous noise it makes when you're carving it into bits and pieces. Um, it has that ridiculous high pitched squealy noise that makes dogs want to roll over and I don't know, makes my teeth sit on edge. But I just kind of grin and bear it, get my carving done, and then after that, the rest is easy. But the um, the trick with the Celotex is to use a good knife uh, that's got a decent edge on it. It doesn't have to be razor sharp. As long as you're slow and steady, you'll find that you'll cut through this stuff with the greatest of ease. And you can do all kinds of wonderful things with this foam. It's absolutely amazing. So as you can see, it already starts to look just with like a liberal application of chunks of the styrene which would have gone to waste in any other day I suppose if I hadn't have felt so um, you know environmentally minded and wanted to recycle everything then uh, a lot of this stuff would have probably just been classed as waste material we just binned it which doesn't help us make cool looking rubble now I've already put in probably as much as I need of this foam so I'm just going to try and stick this last piece down there um, any bits of PVA that you see pouring out Get a bit of rubble, jam it in there, poke it in with your finger, let the PVA get soaked up and uh, and do what the PVA's got to do. So look for your gaps, fill the gaps with PVA, and then once those gaps are filled with PVA, fill them with a bit of foam. All right. So there we are, I've done my, um, my little pile of rubble there. I'll just bandy the camera around a little bit for you. So as you can see, it looks quite nice. And that was a very, very small amount of effort. Now, this B&M's um, decorative sand that I keep harping on about, let me just show you this stuff here. It's this stuff right here, B&M's decorative sand. It's £1.49 for a decent sized tub of it, right? It's great, it's absolutely amazing for this modeling uh, kind of work that we're gonna be doing here. Um, I mix it with my tea leaves and everything to make my, deck, my, my scatter material. It just goes on for miles. I don't, I don't know when I'll be buying the next round because I've used this a lot. Um, all I'm going to do, I'm just going to bodge a bit more PVA over the top of this. This will help to fix everything in place when it dries. Um, and in order to help do that, I'm just going to cover this in the decorative sand. I'm not going to be afraid to go around the outsides a little bit because this is going to be representative of my um, littler bits of, of rubble and stuff. And I'm going to just literally pour a bunch on pack it in with my fingers and I'm just going to let that set um, and that's pretty much it I mean there's nothing gracious about any of this pour it on because what we'll do later on we'll tip it off once the glue has gone off and then we'll hit this then with the, uh, the tea leaves and the, uh, the uh, well just tea leaves probably I think there's enough gravel um, on this for me to not worry about my usual tea leaf and gravel mix so yeah, just get it in here, use your finger, press it all in. Don't worry about moving your um, your bits of styrene rubble about, okay? Because um, every time you apply a little bit of pressure, you're just compacting it all, which is what you want really, and uh, pushing in this stuff, which once this all dries off, this will bond itself up amazingly, um, and will shake off all the, the loose bits. The good thing is then, in order to help seal this in later because some people will no doubt be asking how do you seal this how do you stop it all from falling off your tea leaves i can't i can't tell people how much i love using the guts of a tea bag in the modeling as soon as that stuff gets mixed in with glue it doesn't clump but it does stick really really well together highly recommend using tea leaves for as, a, as a bonding agent um, it will just it will gum it up something incredible put it if you need something really strong it's tea leaves and super glue and you are away and welcome back I've painted everything up now using black spray a dusting of gray spray and an even lighter dusting of um, white spray just to give us this sort of gray finish you may notice there's some streaky paint effects on the walls here this is my my dirty wash which is basically some brown, some black, very, very thin down, and then just a little dollop of uh, dish soap 
just to help it to spread out once it gets painted on. And when I apply it, I literally apply quite heavily across the top and just let it flow down. Now, the camera doesn't do a great job picking it up, but what I can tell you is it's got that real sort of grimy look to it now. Um, whereas when it was just sort of sprayed nice and neat, it, it looked like grey concrete. Now it feels like it's got a bit of age to it. So, as per my last um, sort of experimental tile, I'm using those drawing pins again in order to create my lamps. And there's a bit of cardboard on the top to create the deflector, so when I do my object source lighting, um, I have a reason to stick a cone of light there. I've also, this time, used some florist wire here, um, which was very easily bent into the right sort of shapes using some um, jeweler's pliers, round nose pliers, which are absolutely brilliant for making these hooks, which are just glued and then pushed into the polystyrene to create the cable hanging hooks. Um, my thinking here is, is that I've got my, my power lines running to my lights. That's where I can justify my power after. Um, someone made a, a humorous comment about you get light in your underhive. So I thought, yes, we do. We're posh in our part of the underhive. We have power. Um, I've also used it to create some of this uh, broken looking rebar in the ruins as well. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to apply a little bit of colour. Um, I used red in the tiles in my last piece, so I'm going to continue with that theme. Anything which is plain um, is going to be having uh, red very roughly applied. Um, and then I'll come back. I will put on some rust colour patches using some oranges, just dabbing it quite freely all over the place. I use this dry brush, <coughs> excuse me, um, because the bristles are soft enough for me to be able to paint it, but at the same time, I can still stipple with that when I want to apply. And then I'll apply some light silver colours to sort of demonstrate where on the metal works. And then I will come back and I'll use a Nuln oil over the whole thing to darken it right down. So let's stick some colour on this. Hey there guys, so we're on to the final little bit now of this piece of terrain, which is the object source lighting. Now I'm going to be using two brushes mainly for this. I'm using the Citadel base brush, which has the lovely pointed end, nice flat. And I'm also going to be using the uh, Citadel dry brush, a big old soft bristled thing. Um, which is great for finishing off what we're trying to do here with the object source lighting. Now, <clears throat> you can do object source lighting with any colour. Um, I just happen to be going for the, um, the sort of yellow source lighting, like your old street light style ones, because I think it adds to the dirty, grimy effect of what I'm trying to go for here. So most of my colours are going to be oriented around the yellow colour scheme. So I've got the Vallejo Amarillo Salado, Sun Yellow. I've got the Bone White, which is important to differentiate from the Dead White, which is like a pure white, because I'll mainly be mixing up the yellow with this Bone White so that it kind of, it bleaches out without being too white. And then white will be the final mix I put in kind of in my last bit, just for what's effectively going to be the brightest bit. And when you do the object source lighting, you kind of want to overdo the highlights on the last bit, um, is how I would describe it. So the most extreme bit closest to the light source is going to be the bit that's going to have the white, but you don't want to do too much because we're going for yellow lights. Now what I'll do is I'll try and lift up this tile and show you what I've got on the camera here. You may be able to see it. If you look underneath, you can just about make it out. I'll try and zoom into this for you a little bit here. Here we go, let's have a look. You can see I've painted underneath the lamp yellow. Now that is purely just so that is me justifying where my, my light source is going to be coming from. Now, what I, I want to really sort of get people to understand with object source lighting is you kind of have to do your outline and work back to the brightest bit. So what you're going to be doing is, well, you'll be drawing almost a straight line down in line with where your arc of light would come. And then once you hit the base, you're almost going to draw a circle. 
that's going to extend um, to give you your area of light and obviously you'll join that circle up with a line here now I always tend to do this with a uh, an outline first very very watered down yellow very thin just so I can barely see it and then what I'll do is I'll basically color in that outline with that thin down yellow you don't want to be putting too much pigment on it's got to be really really light um, because if you put anything more than that you're going to just look it, it's going to look more painted rather than light is is fading out um, so that is the the concept here you're going to draw your outline in a very thin down yellow and uh, color it in and then what we'll do is we will add more pigment to it in the bleach bone kind of color um, the bone white and we're just going to again color in that outline but we're going to leave the yellow showing at the edges so our, our area of coloring is going to reduce each time and that's how we're going to do our object source lighting so i will be going into a, a sort of speedy video for this to try and show you i'll try not to move the tile too much as i'm painting um just so you get an idea although i may have to get my hands into it um, what i would suggest you do if you haven't done object source lighting before is to make a wall stick it to a base um, it doesn't have to be a pretty wall just paint it black and then just practice just practice a little bit because um, you can always re-undercoat it and give it another go it's more about getting the, the the idea right in your head and it's, it's kind of hard to explain so you actually got a brush in your hand and you've given it a go so under no circumstances should you be afraid to try this and make a mistake because I know I made a lot of mistakes when I was sort of figuring out how to do it but now that I've done it I'm a lot more confident I'll just get on with it um, and I also don't judge myself too harshly and neither should you. Um, you know, it's got to look good to your standards and as long as you're happy with it, that is all that matters. So without further ado, let's speed this up. And there we go guys that is um, quite literally it that is how you do your object source lighting now um, when you're doing this you're gonna look at it and you're gonna think oh my god that looks really rough but you know you just have to persevere with it and just get get into it and you know what have a bit of confidence and you will be fine now one thing I forgot to mention before I got into the speedy uppy video bit when you're doing your dry brushing it's very very important that what you do is you dry brush away from the light source never towards it because you'll find then that you'll end up such as down here you'll end up with all these little uh, shady patterns as a natural result of the dry brushing i'll just try and get zoomed in here a little bit for you so you can see you'll see that the um the shade still sits underneath which allows you to sort of create the uh, illusion of shadow and light. As I said, the paintwork is rough and ready looking, all right? I'm not gonna shy away from it. I'm not gonna pretend to be Picasso or anything like that. But what you do is you dry brush away from the light source. Don't worry about how rough it's looking. Take your time, put a few lighter layers on. And as you can see, I have a almost like a that pale yellow outer sort of section. Then I've got another wedge of lighter yellow, which is mixed with that sort of bleach bone color. And then right in the middle, I have this almost arrow vertical line there and then two diagonal lines there that I've sort of worked around to create the um, impression of light coming from the light source. So what I'll do now is I'll just quickly spin this thing around so you can see it without it being in hyperlapse form. So you can see I've got my two lights made from pins here and I have the one light around the side which I've done here um, and I mean these didn't take me very long to do at all and then the central section of this tile is where I'm not going to be applying any lights so that when we're playing under normal circumstances this central section of the board should look quite dark now what I will say is when I was painting it and we had the uh, orange dabs on there to make the impression of rust um, it looked really very stark but then I put a known oil wash over everything 
And I mean, I was very generous with the Nolan Oil. I just lathered it on there and that brings it all right back down and gives you the sort of finish that you want. I have a nice dirty, dank looking uh, bit of scenery here, which I'm quite happy with. Um, and I think that when I'm playing my sort of grim, dark games in the future, it's gonna look okay. I'm just gonna get the other tile from my shelf and then what I could do is I'll, I'll pair them up next to each other so you can see them together and you'll see. Let's just move this around a little. Um, get these sort of stacked up side by side. They don't fit perfectly together. I'm not too worried about the perfect fit between the two tiles. All I know is I'm quite happy to be able to play Necromunda with a setting that looks a bit like that. It's quite nice. Be a lot of fun having uh, miniatures running all over over this thing. I've got my collapse sections which I think look quite good they turned out okay you know it's gonna be nice having models running across there uh, yeah I'm really looking forward to putting together some more tiles and uh, my aim is now to put together another two and then come back to you guys uh, with another video for the next one with a big hole in it which I've already got the tile work in progress and then uh, return to you with a two foot by two foot section of board so that should be uh, quite quite nice something to look forward to there. And a great thing about this this as well, um, before I sign off on this video here and let you guys say wonderful or not wonderful things about it, this particular tile here that I've made, the one that we've just showcased, that has cost me less than three quid to make, to make this tile, less than three quid. Um, there will be some descriptions of costs um, listed below so you know take a look at those but I can tell you now if cost is something which is holding you back in terms of making terrain don't let it be um, you know by all means contact me and I'll, I'll point you in some directions for some sensible purchases I probably spent in grand total no more than I don't know 40 quid perhaps um, but that's going to give me enough material to make an entire Necromunda um, game board and probably more to spare as well um, and I, I know that's a lot cheaper than, than buying the the retail items so yeah thanks very much for watching guys very much appreciate you taking the time um, by all means leave me some comments and let's have a conversation I look forward to bringing you the next video thank you very much